<laughs> Grab a seat. Hello, hello. Kia ora, everybody. My name is Colette. I run the startups team for AWS, which means I have the enormous privilege to work with thousands of startups across Aotearoa and Australia. And Craig, can I just say, you blow me away. Honestly, what you've done with Halter is so impressive, and I think you have a lot of fans in the audience, right? Nice. So one of the things that stood out for me just uh, listening to you talk was really that trifecta of purpose and, and people and then nailing the right product. So we're going to dig into that a little bit today. Um, I heard someone say once that once uh, farmers use Halter, they don't ever go back. Um, can you tell me a little bit about one of your proudest customer stories um, that just really made you so happy to, to see? Yeah, good, good question. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, a sticky product. Um, and there are even some cases where you know, farms have fences today and our goal isn't to uh, remove fences, it's to be more precise and flexible than that. But we have plenty of situations where farmers are so confident in the technology that they uh, are pulling fences out. And so you're sitting there being like, okay, yeah, this is like, this is commitment, um, which is good. Obviously, when you have uh, an impact, then um, they're fully on board. So, um, but the proudest moment, Oh, there's, there's so many. Um, these, like the first time, uh, our, my parents' farm is our, is our research farm, our test farm, and I remember the first time we were out, it was like my dad's birthday, and we were out at dinner in Hamilton or something, and it was raining, and, um, and he pulled out his phone, and just very casually, like we were just talking, and it was just on the table, and he like shifted the herd of cows out of this wet paddock into this dry one up the hill, and I was sort of there like, holy shit, that's like... Before Halter, that would have been quickly finish your meal. Shit, we've got to get home. We've got to, um, we've got to shift the stock. And that was like this first um, very tangible um, impact, I guess. That's so beautiful. Um, now, I guess it would be easy for all of us to sit here and just look at the tip of the iceberg and go, oh, yeah, startups are just you know, joys and successes all the way along. But tell me, tell me a little bit about what's been some of the most challenging days for you. It's like where you really had to push yourself to get up and go move that ball forward. Yeah, uh, lots of technical ones, um, lots of times. You often go from like the highest of highs to the lowest of lows in a, the same day or even the same hour sometimes. Um, it's, it's wild. It's like, um, and you, you, learn to, you learn to love that. That's actually uh, one of the most exciting parts in the end. Um, probably the toughest ones are like team-related, um, around like growing people or... Um, you know, you're you're often pushing people to achieve more than they even think is possible, and that, and that can be really challenging. And um, so, yeah, probably team-related um, would be some other examples. There are plenty of of long days and, and sleepless nights and things like that. But um, you're really selling yeah. it here. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. It's <laughs> like I wouldn't trade it for the world. I yeah, it was definitely um, like I said at the start. I, I didn't grow up thinking, oh, I want to start a startup. It was purely. Um, it happened out of wanting to solve a problem, which is very classic for engineers. They love solving problems. Um, and I'm so glad that it happened. Like, I, I was actually saying to Sam recently, like, the purity of a startup and just this constant need to solve problems and to advance and to be better makes, I think, the people within it better people. It definitely makes me a better person, like, um, yeah, personally, so. Nice. Um, so the quote you had up earlier around the team you build is the company you build, not the plan that you make. Um, let's double click a little bit on team because I love that. So rattle off a couple of words to us, you know, describing your team. <laughs> um, we, there's a post-it note behind my desk on the wall that says outthink, outwork, outcare, um, which is a great like, way to think about team or culture. Um, other people have described uh, our team is like hardcore and empathetic. Um, uh, we talk a lot about high performance. We talk a lot about sports teams. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot to learn from, from sports teams around. Um, yeah. Is that reflective of you? Uh, as an athlete? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, not at all. Um, yeah, I think like in a way, you, you have, the culture you build has to be true to you. Um, it's got to be true to everybody in it. Really, otherwise, like, it's 
I don't know, it wouldn't work. Startups are hard enough. You don't want to see it. <laughs> yeah, you don't need it. Yeah. Um, so what, what sort of behaviors do you go out of your way to cultivate in your team? Um, this is very, uh, I can, I'll answer this, but this is very, um, I guess, personal or uh, specific to a, to a culture. So, um, and so every business is different, but we, we really value uh, persistence and grit. Um, we obviously value attitude. Um, we hire a lot of young, hungry um, people, and, and if they have experience, great, but uh, if we have to teach them that, then that, that's okay. Um, we value hard work, for sure, um, but we also, you know, it's not the only measure. Um, we value people that can think, think smartly, and then care. Care is a huge part, huge part of it. If you care about your work, your workmanship, your teammates, um, that's the difference between uh, a, lot of, a lot of good things and a lot of great things is how much someone cares. Um, so, yeah, hard to measure that one, but it is, it's important. Nice. Um, so at Amazon, we've got this you know, mentality around day one. You know, every day is day one again, and part of what you talked about earlier reminded me of that. Um, and it's this notion that you know, every day you, you, you start afresh, every day is a day to innovate, every day is a day to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so... One of the things that dawned for me when I when I joined AWS specifically was that you know when you're in a company that's growing like 30 to 40 percent a year, you have to outgrow that as a leader, and you have mm. to constantly be growing more than that to help everybody mm. else grow at that 30 to 40 percent per year. So and, and you know for me that was terrifying. <laughs> I imagine then you know looking at the growth of Halter, that must be super terrifying for you. So how do you um, do you take time to then reflect and how do you think about your own self development as a leader? Yeah, that was a great question. Um, there's an extreme positive to the company growing very fast, which is for everybody within it, um, there's pretty much unlimited opportunity, right? Like there's no, you're not waiting for your manager to move on or anything like that. Like everyone's growing and it's growing quicker than most people can keep up. So um, that's exciting for anyone that's ambitious and, and hungry to, to achieve. Um, for me though, I think, uh, yeah, it's constant. Like you're always having to, to be better. There's heaps of tactical things you can do, um, and you should pull on any tactical any tactical lever you have. Um, coaching, psychologist, reading. I don't know. Getting a good network of people to talk to other startups. Um, but I think the most important is who you're surrounded by. Um, you're a product of your closest five people, um, and that plays into the importance of having the right team. Um, so for me, a big part of that's been hiring a really good exec team um, and people that are far better at their jobs than you are. Um, and that's a great thing. That's not a threat. That's if any, that just lifts you up. And so um, that's been a, a huge part of it. Um, and, and yeah, and then probably step one is just knowing that it's happening. Uh, every time you feel like you've got it sorted you'd like double the team size and then everything, you know, well, not everything goes out the window, but it's all just irrelevant now and you've got to relearn how to, you know, managing 10 people or even one person obviously was quite hard. We, we didn't do a good job of that, the first one, but um, <laughs> then managing 10 and then 30 and then 100, and, uh, like it. Um, we haven't crossed the 150, um, 150 team size, which is a scary number to cross, but... Yeah, you're dumb yeah, 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 so ask me about that in, in a year's time, but... Can't wait. Yeah, <laughs> be terrifying then. Um, so you, I'm glad that you said the you know the the product of the five people because we have spoken about that previously. So, do you consciously pick your five people? Uh, I don't have like a top five, um, but I I definitely think about it a lot. I'm very conscious who I spend time with, um, and that's you obviously spend a lot of time with people at work. So that's very true for for your people at work, but that's true for the rest of my life uh, as well. Um, I think you can be very intentional about, yeah, who you talk to, who you hang out with, all that type of stuff. Um, I think, um, I don't have kids, but probably to every parent in the room, you would live and breathe this every day, seeing your kids' friends being like, shit, that's not the right group. Or, <laughs> um, and so, and you can see the influence that has, and so like, that's happening every day to you as well. So, um, yeah. So... I think a lot of uh, people in the audience, you know, obviously draw a lot of inspiration from, from your journey. And, you know, so I want to talk a little bit about that journey of kind of becoming and now realizing that you are a role model for, you know, <laughs> founders and how terrifying that must be. <laughs> yeah. um, how's, how have, do you think about yourself as a role model for New Zealand founders? Mm, not really, to be honest, but um, 
uh, I'm happy to, like, I was very lucky to have, um, once I went to Peter Beck and told him that uh, I had, I was working on this side thing and I was going to leave and do that, um, he was incredibly supportive. Um, and he ended up joining our board and he even invested a little bit of, of cash. And this was early days as well. This is before Rocker Lab had, you know, was worth billions of dollars. And so that was quite an, uh, a special achievement. And he, even today, is still a, a close friend and mentor and is very helpful. So I feel very lucky to have had that in our journey. And that's completely changed the direction of Halter and, uh, and every month we have a board meeting. And, and I still feel very lucky to, for, um, to work with our board. And so if I can help others, then like, that's, I'm always up for that. Um, but uh, I don't necessarily see myself as, a, as like a role model to, to do that. But. Tsk, tsk. Um, do you think there's some, you know, for one of the things that I love about New Zealand founders is just there's, there's a lot of big picture thinking and there's a, this real global ambition that I find comes from, from founders from New Zealand. Um, what do you think we can do a little bit more of to keep raising the bar and our global ambition from... Um, I, th I think we do have uh, ambition, um, for sure. I think we could have way more of it. Um, uh, if you ever want to get a feel for that, you just spend time in the US or like in a lot of other countries. There's not often, uh, often it's, it's over, overconfident, but it's still a pretty helpful lens to go through. And that's definitely something which we constantly are having to, to that, you're a product of the five closest people. They're probably going to be people in New Zealand, right? That's, they're probably going to be Kiwis. Um, and for better or for worse, there are a lot of common traits uh, across all of New Zealanders. Um, we typically are a little bit more humble. We're, um, we're not as ambitious as, as we could be. And, and so consciously trying to break out of that and spend time with, with other people and people overseas is, is really important. So for me, yeah, getting on a plane is just so important. Trying to... Um, you know, spend time in the US or wherever it is, Europe, um, and trying to get a feel for that is, uh, is super helpful. So when we couldn't just hop on a plane and spend time yeah. overseas, um, how did you keep growing your global ambition from right here? Yeah, it's hard, uh, for sure. That's uh, pr prior to COVID, probably was in the US every couple of months for, for a couple of weeks, so averaging like a, a week a month. And that's not because we have customers there. Um, that's purely because uh, like our banks are there, our lawyers are there, our, a bunch of our investors are there. Um, obviously, Sam and Blackbird are here but, and, and others. But um, yeah, so we used to do it a lot. Uh, you try and do it on Zoom. It's not as good, well, my, in my opinion, not as good. But, um, and then since we can fly again, definitely am. So yeah, it's, uh, and I, I could be better at it. I definitely, it's like for, reflect, reflecting on uh, for myself, is like I definitely could find more time to have those conversations and work with, with other people. Um, what, are well. some, what are some big thinking companies that you'd love to spend more time with the founders of anywhere in the world? Oh, there's, uh, there's loads of them. Um, anything that's just like, when you first look at, look at it, you go like, what? <laughs> How's that gonna work? Um, uh, so there's, uh, often you look at your portfolio like founders, so other companies within Blackbird or um, within other VCs, um, you look at, uh, you've got to be careful looking at uh, big tech companies. There's a lot of stuff within big tech that survives because they can afford to be inefficient because they've, you know, they've already made the magic money-making machine way earlier. So, um, so I don't tend to look at too many, you know, I'm not walking around trying to turn Holter into Google or anything uh, in terms of culture-wise. Um, obviously, they're massively successful, but uh, so often they're smaller named um, companies, yeah, in the US that aren't household names. Fair enough. He's being very coy with this one. <laughs> um, I am going to switch to some of the Slido questions, so if you don't have your Slido questions in, feel free to pop them in for us. I do want to ask you, though, Craig, um, what are some of the problems? Like, Halter, as you can tell, you know, your passion and the real purpose and the impact that you can see this company making in the world. Um, what are some other big problems that you'd love to see founders here actually start focusing on more? Damn, that's a good question. I have a very special place for um, technology that's in the real world. Um, obviously, there's a lot of good in software and AI and stuff that's on a screen or on, running on a server somewhere. Uh, but if you're building in the real world, it, it just seems often it's harder. Um, at, 
there is, which there's upsides to that, but I think any, any real world problems or like, uh, there's loads of them, right? There's, uh, there's climate, there's uh, heaps to do with um, many challenges around uh, education, there's, there's a lot. But if you can build in the real world, I think your, imp your potential impact is a lot, is a lot bigger. Um, you know, to think that half the world's landmass is agriculture and, and most farmers are still just walking around, you know, just running on intuition or doing what they did, doing what their parents did or their grandparents did and is, is crazy. The thing that, just double click on that, like, uh, there are many known ways to be better in agriculture. Um, there are lots of techniques, but a lot of them are blocked just by like, ah, oh, that's too hard, takes too long, you know, these frustrating constraints. Um, and so that blows my mind. It's like, you know, sure, it's hard to get tech in there because uh, it's in the middle of nowhere and you've got to build hardware and you've got to talk to it, all that stuff. But if you can do that, you know, you have a pretty big opportunity to have impact. So, so solving real, real problems yeah. for real people. Yeah. I love that. Um, I might switch to a couple of questions here um, and jump around. And I wanted to ask, uh, sorry, Will, Will wanted to ask, um, how do you elevate ambitions and set realistic targets at the same time? So... I think that might be team performance related. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say we, uh, we lean on the side of ambition rather than realistic targets. Um, so we'd ha one of our a critic would, would say that a lot of our targets aren't realistic or hard to achieve, but also you don't really know what's possible until you start, you know, start moving on something. So... Um, we lean on the side of ambition. Um, some people, you know, you could call them stretch goals, whatever you want. Uh, it's important to remind people that even if you don't necessarily achieve that crazy ambitious target, if you get pretty close to it, then that's still, I mean, there's still a lot to be proud of there. Um, so no, we, we bias to ambition. Uh, we think it lifts performance. Awesome. Um, is Halter profitable? If so, can you talk about your journey from burn to profit? If not, can you talk about your always be raising journey? Yeah, good, good question. Um, we're still pretty early on the uh, on that journey, and um, I think the uh, the a, a side effect of being ambitious and ambitious and really wanting to have impact is that there is, you know, our backlog of things to build and R and D to do is like hundreds of things long. So we are still pushing pretty hard on uh, on R and D, and so we're growing faster than than our revenue. So in short, no, today we're not profitable, um, but we're fortunate to have you know. Good VCs and and uh, and that's we if we really wanted to go that route we we probably could um, but that's not the business I want to build um, and we didn't have to make the initial decision on bootstrapping versus raising money I was a student I had no money so <laughs> that was it was pretty simple but um, even today I think Holt is better off for it yeah. because of the people involved. I actually want, do want to ask about that. You know, you've got some amazing backers in your in your VCs, and Blackbird obviously being one of your biggest champions. Like, mm -hmm. What are some of the things? So aside from money, because I think uh, first time founders always, you know, they tend to look at this for. It's like, where do I get the money to do the thing that I want to do? But what else do you? What else do you get from having VCs back you that you don't normally get if you were bootstrapped? Yeah, good, good question. The, um, the cheapest thing uh, an investor gives you is their money. Um, you, you, you're looking for value add. This is a key word or magical word. Um, you're looking for investors that can really help. Um, that is tricky. There's a lot of investors that think they have value add that definitely don't um, and probably are net negative. So you've got to do your, do your homework. Um, talk to other founders, um, you know, do reference calls, look at history, do all that stuff. Um, because it's so important. When I first started, I remember... Um, we had this list of investors, and and you're pretty much like, oh sweet, there's you know these dollar signs and these big numbers, and you add it all up, and the bigger the better. Um, and it was Pete Beck that was like, absolutely not. <laughs> like he was just crossing off names, um, and he's like, this is a marriage. This is more stressful than a marriage. This is at least ten years, and like you know, he's like, you gotta be, <laughs> you gotta be careful who you who you who you let in the door, and so. Um, I'm very thankful to that because um, that roller coaster is, if you've got people on board that are going to freak out every time something's not going well, it's not very helpful. Um, and so you need people that get it. And so, yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, that shared vision. Um, another question here that I think 
some people might want to know is, can you explain very simply how the tech works on the cow and how it trains them? Yes, I can attempt to do that. So um, it's you're conditioning an animal, or you're trying to train this animal, learn this animal. So um, it's the great thing about training is you have to be consistent, repeatable, um, reliable. Um, if you've ever thought about training a dog, for instance, um, or, or anything really, um, and software is really good at that. Software is 24/7. It you know never makes a mistake. Well, if you write it right, um, and so it's it's. It's very good. And so that is the, the key insight. Anyone on a farm knows you can train cows. You Cows try to learn your voices. They, ha, like, they learn habits. Um, on daylight saving, when the, when the clock moves an hour, you, you go, if you go down there an hour late, they're all standing at the gate. They're all like, what the hell? <laughs> and so you've got to do it in 15-minute gaps. And so you know that these animals are trainable, and we use software to do that. And so our, we use cues. Our primary cues are sound and vibration. Um, and they're the ways that we interact. Um, we, the system runs when it's, when it's up and running. And so, um, and that's, uh, you can get right, eat, for every cow it's different. Um, every profile, personality, a heifer to like a 10 year old, um, that has to be different and has to learn that animal. Um, yeah, and the key, these, I won't go super deep, but the key is like this concept of predictability and control uh, and agency. You're trying to, ensure an animal understands and is able to make, um, you know, is able to actually work with the system. And that's when you start to see cool things like cows um, uh, really like trying to find extra bit of grass and like they, you can, they really show these things which um, you can see they understand how the system works. But. Wow. So your customer interviews are with the cows or the farmers? <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, actually, so Aidan Bright wanted to ask a question around what has been the biggest barrier to scaling up and in exporting? So when you start thinking really globally. Yes. Um, so we initially started in just the Waikato. Uh, New Zealand's definitely the best place to start this business. We, the density of, um, of agriculture here is, is very, very high. So um, we started in just the Waikato. We had a big backlog even today. Um, I'll global pipelines like $250 million of ARR. So, um, and so we just were like, oh, we'll just start expanding outwards from that. That was a blessing and a curse because, um, you know, some of the things which you probably should have solved, you don't because you can just drive 10 minutes down the road and just do it with a person. So uh, we, over the start of this year, started expanding from the Waikato to Canterbury to Southland uh, and, and all around. And, um, you know, even to the West Coast. So, you know, we're obviously not sending people from Auckland to the West Coast every day. So you, you start to have to automate a lot of the edge cases and um, even simple things like uh, resetting someone's password or, you know, you've got to start to do all this stuff um, remotely. And so that, um, there's been that journey. And then at the moment, we're looking forward. It's, it's what does that look like in Europe and South America and the US? Um, and yeah, there's a lot of barriers to that, right? Culture, language, um, how do you do business in Brazil? Like, we haven't worked that one out yet, but um, we'll have to do that in the, in the next few months. And so, yeah, again, I think it's people. I think it's like, how do you, how do, you do that with people? Awesome. So lots of challenges there, but scaling up, you know, a server isn't one of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how many data, so somebody actually asked this question here around how many data points do you actually capture in a day? Um, it's like thousands, uh, thousands a minute. Um, we collect, uh, the, our, our biggest constraints, uh, how do you get the data off the devices? Um, so we do a lot of processing on the, um, on the collar itself. We run um, heuristics and models and whatnot on that to, uh, be looking for certain behaviors and then send just the behavior back, but also we want to get the raw data so we can train new models and um, and so we use Wi-Fi and um, to, to do big data dumps, but we also use uh, a like version of LoRaWAN um, and so yeah, it's thousands of points a minute. We um, yeah, we know a lot about a lot about these cows. There's a lot of uh, a lot of fun stories about in the early days when you just have all this data, you've got to label it somehow. And we had, you know, a van with like eight 4K cameras on it, and uh, we had a team in Auckland that was just watching videos of cows and labelling um, <laughs> what these cows are doing, like sleeping, just lying down, not asleep, eating, <laughs> urinating, <laughs> mooing, like, and then you can staring off into the distance, being a cow. <laughs> yeah, um, 
yeah, and um, headbutting another cow, like whatever it is. And then you train these models to, um, and then you can start to build up like, oh, this is how a cow spends their day. Um, and these are the signs of, like here's a, a great example. For a farmer to tell a cow's lame, they do it visually. So they look at a cow, and if the gates change, if the cow's limping, they're like, oh, that cow's lame, has a sore hoof. Um, but at that point, it's, cows are stoic, so they're trying to hide that, the early onset of that as much as they can. Um, and so when they're limping, it's so bad they can't hide it anymore. And so the onset of, of lameness can be like eight weeks prior to you vis um, visually being able to identify it. So, but uh, before that, other things start to happen. So voluntarily, a cow will walk normal, but if they get to choose, they don't. Uh, they're not walking around as much as they could be. So you put them in a paddock, and they eat really quickly and sit down because um, their hoof's sore. And so... No farm is ever going to tell that with 300 cows or 1,000 cows. Um, but that's very obvious in the data, right? This cow's walking way less than it was. Um, activity's down. It's eating quicker. So all this stuff plays in, and all of a sudden, you can, um, you can really... We've got loads of, like, we've saved these cows' lives and all that stuff. Um, so It's been really awesome to see it if, you know, all happen sort of on the, the background and the back end of what you're doing as yeah. well. But um, So there you have it. If we ever want, you know, farms and cow farms in the metaverse... Cray's going to have the most accurate uh -huh. cow farm for us to, uh, to work on. Um, look, I think this has been super fascinating just to double click on like a lot of the, the things that you touched on, but really understand kind of how you think about your startup and the opportunity and, and the opportunity for founders here too. Um, one of the things I've just really admire about you is that you can be both so, you know, take, acknowledge your success, but also stay so, so humble. And it makes, it really gives me um, the sense that, you know, anybody can really get started. You didn't know what you were doing when you got started, and, and here we are. So um, is there any reason that you think um, founders, you know, in a short, sharp little burst, um, couldn't do this, couldn't start? If they were thinking about it, what would you tell them to do? Mm, I don't know if I have a great one-liner to end, but no, there was nothing. Like I say, I was a uni student. I knew nothing about uh, running or starting businesses. It was just something I cared about, um, and it was a problem with wanted to solve, so yeah, I, I love it. I like. I know I, I try to speak very candidly about like all the, the hard parts of it, but it's the most rewarding and uh, exciting thing, so yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for the world. Awesome, there you have it, guys. Thank you so much, Craig, for sharing today. Cool. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.